afternoon, everybody, or good morning, and welcome to those who may be watching uh, on today's recording. Uh, I would like to give you a, a little bit of an opportunity to uh, review some Microsoft Teams um, how-tos at the beginning. Uh, so a list of all of our upcoming webinars, as well as all of our recorded webinars, are available on the NICER website. That's nicer.usf.edu. Any of the links on any of the slides are active, so you can go ahead and click on them. Um, you can subscribe to our NICER mailing list uh, to stay connected uh, for all of our upcoming and uh, recorded webinars. Um, you are in a listen-only mode, which means you will not be able to speak to our uh, presenters directly, but you do have the opportunity to submit any number of questions throughout today's presentation by utilizing either the Q&A box or the chat box. Both are available for you in the top um, left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, you also um, have the opportunity to view those that are logged in by clicking on the people or attendee list. And then finally, at any point, feel free to give our uh, presenter some kudos by using the applause, thumbs up, heart tools, so on and so forth uh, throughout today's presentation. If you experience any audio or technical difficulties throughout today's presentation, my recommendation would be to click on the three little buttons that, uh, with the more tab, click audio settings, um, you can use uh, your telephone to connect to today's uh, webinar. And then finally, at the end of today's presentation, simply click the leave button at the end to um, hang up or end the meeting. So with that, again, welcome everybody to today's National Institute for Congestion Reduction webinar. My name is Stephanie Lewis. I will serve as your moderator today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our two, speak our two speakers. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Mr. Jason Jackman. He is a senior research associate with the ITS Traffic Operations and Safety Team at the University of South Florida. Jason has extensive experience managing safety campaigns, safety education development, micro mobility evaluation programs, uh, outreach education strategies and implementation, communication development, project management, program analysis, and pedestrian and bicycle safety. Uh, Presenting with uh, Jason today will be uh, Tia Boyd. Tia is a research associate uh, here at Cutter. Uh, her research focuses on transportation decision making with an emphasis on multimodal transportation planning, public participation, so and the social impacts of transportation. She has led several projects developing methods and tools that support transportation planning processes. Uh, and Tia was the co-facilitator for the Tampa Bay Citizen Academy of Transportation, a virtual academy geared toward community empowerment through education. So with that, it is my pleasure to now hand the presentation over to Jason. So Jason, take it away. Thank you, Stephanie. Really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone being here today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I do want to say I'm happy to be here presenting uh, with my colleague, Tia Boyd. We had such a, an amazing experience with the TBCAP program. And I got to say the, the growth of not only the program, but the idea that we're able to empower citizens and, and they can take what they've learned and, and really be a part of the transportation decision making process. It's exciting, and we were able to catch up later on with a lot of these participants and meet them because it is a local uh, project that we worked on. So we're able to see uh, these participants, these attendees, uh, you know, put their actions um, into play as as participants and as now really decision making um, participants. So it's been it's been a, a wild ride. And I'm happy that we can share this experience in the in the formation of this guidebook. Now, um, I will say this public involvement process, it's important for that transportation decision making. As I mentioned, it helps empower citizens. And I think that was the most vital part of this is that, you know, there we had a citizens attend uh, with this within the city of Tampa. And that was ours, our partner with the project. And they were attending and, and learning and, and learning different uh, aspects of the project, whether it's budgeting or the decision making process or the implementation or the advocate advocacy part. So we were able to provide that information, provide guest speakers uh, for them uh, with participate with these participating agencies. And um, 
with doing that, this helps increase their knowledge on on what they can do to par uh, partake and participate um, in their communities. And that that could be difficult sometimes in understanding. It could be very intimidating, especially for citizens who don't know where to start, or don't know where to vocalize their their needs and and, and what they want their community to look like, especially when it comes to transportation. So this is dating back to 2021 with our year one project with TBCAT, and we were able to grow with that project and and find ways to be more effective with the pro project uh, online. Now the project goal uh, it, for the second year, so we had year one in 2021 and year two was 2022. And that effort was not only the virtual academy, but we also decided, hey, let's put together a virtual uh, guidebook, a Citizens Academy's guidebook. So, so others can use what we've learned through this process for their own communities. So we're very happy that we, we documented everything and we brought everything together and we're able to produce a guidebook for people to share um, for their own communities. The methodology and approach, well, for the two years that TVCAT was hosted, again, we documented our processes and, and the program's outcomes. And these methods were refined and organized into a systematic format reflective of the process to create and implement TBCAT. So again, we're just continuing to collect the information. We collected data that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And um, again, consult our, our, our participants on their experience and what they can do to push forward what they've learned and not just attend a class and it ends there. You know, this is a continuing effort to uh, really bring our communities together. And it was nice, again, working with the city of Tampa on this project because um, it is very, uh, not small community, but it's it's small enough where we can invite people and then maybe see them at um, future meetings and, and have conversations with them, which we have done uh, since the academy has uh, ended recently in 2022. But we still get to an opportunity to kind of talk to them and and kind of get their experience on, on not only the course, but also the outcomes of the course and, and you know, how it has changed their behavior as far as participating in their in this community project. So why a virtual academy? Um, well, we, at the time we had to, and we were planning this um, early 2020, if not 20, end of 2019. So as we all know, the, pandemic hit uh, March, re hit really hard March 2020. So we had to, we had to go virtual. We had ideas of meeting in person originally and just having this uh, this this opportunity to to have a, 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 not a workshop, but actually a course for these participants in person. But it worked out in our favor because we could reach more people going virtually, um, we didn't have to reserve rooms because that is the thing. You know, we have to reserve rooms, find a place to meet. Um, so this actually worked out very well. And it was more appealing at the time because, you know, we thought, hey, well, people are online. You know, this is during COVID in 2021. They're online. Let's reach them now while we can. And it worked out well from 2020 for 2021. You know, shifting to 2022, it was a little bit different experience. We went more with a hybrid experience, but uh, definitely from there, we we learned a lot on not only, um, you know, communicating these efforts with the community, but also bringing it to a more hybrid option instead of virtual. And then we, we kind of, T and I talked about this uh, throughout the second year of the project where, you know, there was a little bit of online fatigue, you know, we felt like, you know, people were online for so long and they wanted more of that uh, in-person experience. So we we offered those opportunities later on and we got that feedback from them that, hey, we they wanted to meet us. They want to do more in person. So uh, a lot learned from from year one to year two and it helped with the growth of the project for sure. And again, for this 2022 project, um, we have the guidebook. This is one of our main focuses. So Tia is going to jump into the the guidebook and what's all, all involved with that, and the, you know the different growth from from what we've learned and and instilled in this uh, guidebook process. Yes, thanks, Jason. So um, as Jason mentioned, we took our what we learned in year one and year two. We took the feedback from the participants. 
we um, got feedback from our presenters, from our partners with the city of Tampa, and we integrated that into a guidebook to provide instruction to other agencies wanting to use a virtual model for their academies, whether on transportation or another topic. Um, we tried to make it as general as possible so that the things that we learned, um, the things that we identified that worked really well or the things that uh, we had to reconsider um, to provide that information with others. So just here's a quick look at uh, the contents of the guidebook, um, it is available online um, and we try to make it as user friendly as possible so that it's easy to flip through, um, identify what section you need if you're using um, the entire guide or just a part of it. So it begins with an introduction, um, provides a walkthrough of how to use the guidebook um, and provides two uh, processes, one to develop the, the Virtual Citizen Academy and the next to implement uh, a list of references. Uh, we did consult some um, secondary sources on um, online learning, on uh, public involvement and um, other academies that, that do exist. Uh, to really make it as comprehensive and robust as possible. And then the appendix includes um, templates and resources that we use for TBCAT that we generalize that can be used by others who are uh, developing academy of their own. So how to use the guidebook? Um, as I mentioned, two processes. The first is to develop the Virtual Citizens Academy, and then the second focuses on implementation uh, using those steps um, in the first part. Uh, each of these uh, processes has a series of steps with detailed instructions and then templates, as I mentioned, to support the development and implementation of the course. And the templates include um, things such as um, the evaluations that we developed, the certificates that we gave to participants at the end, um, letters to potential presenters, um, as well as panelists for the uh, participant projects. So really, a really, really comprehensive set of materials that can be used and customized to uh, persons using the guidebook. So that first step, developing a virtual citizens academy. So the first is to establish the relationship with the partners and stakeholders, um, decide on the course delivery method and develop course content in collaboration with partners and stakeholders. And I'll walk through each of these in a little more detail in the next few slides. So that first part, uh, when establishing the relationship with partners and stakeholders, um, for TBCAT, the city of Tampa was a key stakeholder. They provided financial support through matching funds for the project, but they also were very, very hands on in their involvement. Um, they provided uh, their they shared their local knowledge so they knew who who was typically involved in um, the city's public involvement activities. They know types of questions that get asked. Um, at, at meetings and other events that they have. They understand the areas where um, uh, technically trained residents aren't as familiar with the processes and were able to share that with us so that we can design our content to fill those gaps. Um, they also presented at several sessions um, in addition to just generally attending the ones where they were not presenting, um, which was very, very helpful to um, not only in providing information, but answering questions and participating in those discussions at each session. And um, they also led the walking tour, which we'll talk about a little more later, um, but they were essential to the success of TBCAT. And so as a part of the guidebook, we encourage facilitators or organizers of the Virtual Citizen Academies to partner with the local agency that may be, pre -able, be able to provide that foundational knowledge and that support throughout the course. Um, the next step would be to decide on the course delivery method. There are typically three options when you have an online course. So it could be uh, fully virtual synchronous. And what that is, is um, similar to the class, you're online, but it's live, um, kind of how we are right now for those of you attending in person. Um, asynchronous, which would be um, pre-recorded or um, uh, pre um, um, uh, activities, pre-designed activities that could be completed on their own time. And then hybrid synchronous, so a little bit of both. 
And for each of these, um, I'll give a little more detail. TBCAT was fully virtual synchronous, meaning we had our sessions at a set day at a set time for the eight weeks that TBCAT was offered. And persons could, they could log in and attend. There was the opportunity to um, participate in the chat. We were able to have question and answer sessions live, uh, really have really good discussions in person. Um, uh, we were able to do this without needing to travel. So we're able to save time and resources for needing to travel. There's no need to reserve space. Um, there's no need to um, set up a, um, a technical um, technology in a specific location. So we're able to operate on our own individual laptops or computers or other devices. Um, but there are some limitations to this format. Um, there is limited opportunities for relationship building. So you have to be very intentional about how to build relationships between facilitators, presenters, and between the cohort of participants. Um, there's little or no ability to read the room. Uh, so, you know, typically when you're in person, you can look around and you can see if someone looks a bit confused, if something is really resonating with somebody. Um, that's a bit more difficult to do online unless cameras are turned on. And even then, um, viewing all the cameras at once is uh, not a task that is very easy to do. So there is um, some there are some limitations. Um, furthermore, there are certain population groups that may be excluded from the fully virtual synchronous option, persons who um, do not have access to the internet, persons who have limited uh, or are not, uh, don't have, are not very tech savvy when it comes to technology. And so uh, when you use this type of model, it is important to consider who your audience is, who your participants will be, and really be creative and come up with ways to fill those gaps that present themselves in this model. Um, the next model is asynchronous, so this provides a little more flexibility. There's no set time, there's no set day. People can watch pre-recorded sessions at their leisure. Um, the materials are very easily access accessible. They're typically uploaded online and can be downloaded at the click of a button. Um, and there's a re reduction in scheduling conflicts. You don't have to worry about accommodating people's work schedules necessarily or finding a perfect time that will work for most people. Um, but there are um, there there is a need to identify strategies to keep people on pace, uh, whether that be discussion boards, whether that be assignments or activities. Whenever there is an asynch as asynchronous model in use, it is important to find ways to engage participants, uh, which is a little more difficult even than the synchronous approach. And then there is a hybrid approach where sessions are. Um, in person and virtual. So there's an option for people who may not be able to attend a physical location. Um, this may also be a half and half or, you know, a quarter and three quarters type of setup where a, a set number of sessions are in person or a set number of sessions and then, and then a set are online. Um, or this can be persons who can attend in person are there and there is a computer and a camera and audio set up at the location so that people attending online can participate. Um, this does require space for the in-person offering. People will need to travel to the in-person location um, and there may be a need for um, technology support to make sure that uh, the audio video is working correctly for those persons attending online. For TBCAT, we did record the sessions so that persons who registered for a particular session would also get the recording. So we had a few participants who let us know ahead of time that there were certain weeks that they couldn't attend. They were still able to get that information from that session um, and be able to jump right in into the, the other sessions when they were able to attend. In developing the course content for TBCAT, this was a very collaborative process. As I mentioned, City of Tampa staff work very closely with um, the, the residents in, in the city. Um, and this is certainly the case for other, other local agencies. They are on the ground. They are interacting with the residents. They are um, developing the projects with a public engagement component typically. So we consulted City of Tampa staff very closely to identify the type of content that we should develop. Um, 
and to ensure that it meets the needs of the residents of the city of Tampa. So we looked at um, key themes that we should focus on. Uh, we identified session topics and those learning object objectives. Uh, we looked at the number of sessions and the session time and days that would most likely work for the majority of people who would be interested in participating. Um, we looked at, based on those topics, potential speakers, whether they were in City of Tampa or part of other organizations. Um, we then developed the registration form, which include key questions on not only who the participants are, but their access to and use of the internet and technology and their ability to participate in the virtual platform for TVCAT. And then we marketed the program. So we developed a series of materials to be able to share um, and announce TBCAT and get people registered for the program. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jason. Thanks, Tia. Yeah, so how did people hear about TBCAT? Well, you know, at first we were like, well, people are online right now. It's it's during the pandemic. People aren't really going out in public yet. And, and we were having a tough time actually getting the word out. I mean, we were sharing within our inner circles. Uh, a lot of partners. So we talked to the city, go, hey, you all have a great social media platform, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So the city of Tampa started sharing and we we got an influx of registrations. So we had an online registration uh, for participants. And it turns out, you know, the, the data from the registration, we were able to find out how they registered or how they heard about it. And social media like LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, were the top uh, locations of where they heard about TBCAT, most likely where they did register, obviously, with the, the link provided. But we provided the city with, you know, the, the content to share, the photos to share about the course. So it was that partnership that really helped boost our numbers and, and our registration. Um, and again, we saw a big boost from year one to year two with uh, our registration, especially on social media, through social media. And again, a lot of it's attributed to the city of Tampa, but it could be, uh, you know, attributed to all our partners we worked with from year one too, because it was not just one agency we were working with to as as far as bringing in those guest speakers. We brought in uh, a number of guest speakers from different agencies, so they were able to see what we were doing and then share the following year with uh, their partners and with their with their citizens or you know the, the public, um, whoever's following them on social media. So it, it was definitely a growth in that aspect of, of getting the word out about TBCAT. And then we were able to, from year one to year two, we were able to uh, promote what we had done, what, what the TBCAT program is all about, and the outcomes of year one. So that was a good marketing uh, strategy is, you know, not only do we, did we do the program, but we were able to share the outcomes of the program, which went into year two. Where people access the internet, uh, and that was important. Again, this is uh, all part of the registration survey we, we sent out, and we wanted to make sure everybody had access to the, the TV cat, and we were ready for it. So if they had any issues with the internet, if they didn't have a computer, you know, if there was any access issues, we were there to uh, follow up and make sure they had the opportunity to take this course. Fortunately, we didn't run into that issue, um, again, based on the registration, but we were re readily and available to uh, find a solution to anybody who needs access to the program, which, um, again, that, that's what it was all about. We wanted to get this, this program out to anybody that can and, and willing to take this um, TBCAT program. So we did find out that, you know, most of the, the people that registered and attended uh, were watching this from home. So you have the home internet, but also we had a lot of attendees who were watching the program through their cell phones. And, and the only reason we know that is because either the signal would break out on them and, and they would have to uh, jump back on, or if they were showing their video and talking when they were asking questions, you can tell they're on their, their phone because it's moving around like you know taking a selfie. But um, that's the only way we know besides uh, the, the data that was provided in the registration process. So it was interesting to learn um, the di different aspects of uh, how, where people are learning and, 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 and viewing the course and um, the different uh, uh, technologies or uh, 
systems they're using, whether it's tablet, cell phone, or laptop, or desktop. With implementing the Virtual Citizens Academy, so this is part of this is the second part of the guidebook. We're going to talk about uh, hosting the session, um, develop and distribute the course evaluation, and con conduct the analysis. And then Tia is going to talk about 2.3 to 2.5. So hosting the sessions, uh, it, it's interesting because you know at the this the, the time these sessions were available, we started at, at five o'clock, so it was a two-hour session. Uh, course each each week. So it went from five to seven, which we are asking everybody who may be working and they have to commute home or they're, maybe they're watching this at work or even citizens at home, uh, we're asking them to jump on at five o'clock, which can be a busy time of day to, to commute or travel to any anything. Five o'clock is a busy time, but we had consistency with our attendees, which was nice to see. But we try to be very flexible. And as Tia mentioned, we not only had the live session, but we had the recording sessions as well. Um, and we provided an overview of the, the course at the first session. So we had a little meet, meet and greet. You know, it's one thing to jump on a, a, a live session, a virtual session, and, and all of a sudden we're, we're going and, and talking and, and we have our guest speakers. But it's another thing to you know, start just chatting and having conversations and, and meeting everybody. Now, we didn't have... Uh, you know, 50 people in the session, I'd say we maxed out around 28, but it gives us an opportunity to meet each other and ask questions before we actually start. And we didn't want to put pressure on anyone either. So that first session where we're just talking to them and kind of giving an overview of the course and not really saying, hey, we're, we're not throwing too much information your way right off the bat. We just want to meet you all and see what those needs are and those interests are and getting to know them and not just this uh, being on the other side of the monitor. So it, it was nice to do that. And honestly, you, you gain a lot of support and trust from your participants when you get to talk to them virtually face to face. But when you when you start asking them questions and and seeing their interests, um, allocate time for a view. Uh, virtual meet and greet is, is important. So do that for the beginning for sure. Also, you know, each session as a host, you know, this is not a public meeting and this isn't um, the the place for for people to for, for participants to air their grievances and, and start this huge argument and, and debate. You know, what we wanted to do here is just educate the participants on the processes, whether it's budgeting or planning or implementation or advocacy, you know, whatever it may be, but we wanted to make it focus on transportation and, and, and learning and the empowerment of this course. So if there was any huge di disruption where it just took away from the course, we'd say, hey, we'll get to those questions later, or we just have to put them on mute for, for a long period of time until we can get to their questions, which never really happened. I think there was this uh, understanding throughout the, the course where everybody is very respectable. And that's all we really asked of this. Just be respectful this time. We have a very short time and any other questions we will address, we will send to those guest speakers and, and you will have that conversation. So again, it wasn't really this shut off switch. We said, nope, you can't do it. It was just more like, hey, let's be respectable, respect, uh, respectful of everyone's time because uh, the time is short. Five to seven is not a long time when you have guest speakers and when you have a question and answer session. And there was a one point where we had four guest speakers and that time went by so fast. So again, it was a good learning session, not, not only for the participants, for the hosts as well. We, we learned a lot on how to manage these projects and manage these uh, sessions. So, um, <clears throat> and, and the, the development uh, and distribution of the course evaluation and conduct analysis. So we use Qualtrics, this was a USF, survey online survey tool um, that you at University of South Florida provides us which is great and, and it's a very powerful survey tool and um, we use this each week we we sent a survey out um, on on particip for participants to see how they thought and felt about the 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 module that week so how the speakers were how they what they learned you know, is this gain any of their interest for future meetings where they can advocate and, you know, go to these sessions uh, in, in public sessions? And uh, we got really good responses, which I'll talk about. I think, you know, one of the biggest things was from year one to year two is that some of the online software we use, which we use Teams, 
uh, the Microsoft Teams, which is the online platform to share this information, to have these meetings. Um, there were a few glitches at first from year one, and then going into year two, I think it was flawless. But again, year one, I think I think the the software was still developing. It was, you know, we moved in in light speed uh, from 2000 to uh, 2020 to 2021, and then after that, 2022, I think those glitches were you know obsolete by that point. So um, we learned a lot from our software we use, the, the surveys we sent out to participants. Um, a lot was learned, not only, uh, again, on our end, but on the participants' end as well. Some of the insights from these surveys, again, we did the weekly surveys uh, after the sessions. Um, I think, if anything, uh, we could have asked for a little more responses uh, each week, but we, you know, we had adequate responses uh, for the weekly presentations for those who attended. And for this week, it was, well, actually, this was the commitment to participate which was the original uh, registration survey. So what's their commitment? And we had uh, 2021 to 2022. Um, so there was actually more commitment in 2022 than there was in 2021. Um, again, this is just some of the feedback we got from participants on, on what their commitment and if they will attend. And um, some of the answers here, I will attend most sessions, but have other obligations some weeks. So that's expected. I mean, this is a virtual and the idea that we can provide a uh, recording after, for participants, I think that helps them get more involved, even though they know it's not required for, to attend every session. So there was just uh, very positive points for not only those that are attending, but those who can attend that are very interested and still want to be a part of it. How people attended TVCAT sessions. Um, this is the actual attendance type in year one, in year two. So, you know, as you can see, I wouldn't say there's a drop off uh, with with uh, year one to year two. I would say there was a little bit of uh, virtual fatigue going into year two, but they were still interested in attending the recording. So, as you can see on the 2022, 25 percent attended the the live, and then 25 percent attended the recorded. So we still had that group of, of participants that still were um, very involved. They were sending emails and questions and they wanted the recording and easily accessible to everyone. Um, so again, it's all this learning process of what works, what doesn't work. You know, as, a par as, as opposed to 2021 on the left, I mean, that no, we didn't have a choice. I mean, it was all virtual at the time. But now it's like uh, 2022 on the right. You know, this is an opportunity for not for them not only to participate um, in the live session, but get that recording opportunity as well. And um, we heard a lot of good feedback from our participants saying this is a, a nice option because I can tell you people just got busier in 2022. They wanted to get out more, and you know the the timing wasn't right. But I think that's part of the evaluation of doing this is when is the right time? When is the best time to uh, provide these trainings, and I think that's still pending. What people got from TBCAT? Um, well, as you can see, 2021 to 2022, that growth, this gave me uh, the top line, that gave me confidence to advocate for my community's transportation needs, and I think that is like what we're looking for. We want to empower our community. We want them to be more confident going into these public meetings and these sessions to, to tell their, their leaders what they want in their community as far as transportation needs. So we got a lot out of that with, with our participants. Um, and then we have, after taking this course, I plan to attend city council meetings. This is the second line uh, or attend meetings frequently. So we saw an increase with that. Um, again, that goes with the confidence and that understanding of how these decision-making processes work in, in transportation. And um, in that bottom line, after taking the course, I have a better understanding of how transportation decisions are made. So we saw that growth there, you know, from 2021 to 2022. Um, again, we had two graduating classes and we call them graduating classes because they went through the modules and we felt like there was this this alumni of participants and they got to chat with each other, which we'll talk in a moment and meet in person and kind of talk about their experiences and present their experiences as well. So there was a lot of different facets with this project that were not really planned and just came out to the forefront and said, let's let's use this. This is great. This is great that 2021 and 2022 are talking to each other.
And I'm going to pass it back on to Tia. Yes. So a key part in uh, TBCAT and the design of the Virtual Academy or design of the Citizen Academy was class projects, which allowed us to monitor projects it gave us an opportunity to engage with the participants in another way beyond just the weekly sessions, those two hours every week. And so we used the model from uh, McNeil over in Portland. They have a Citizens Academy. So we used their model for the assignments um, and adapted it to meet the virtual platform. And so um, the goals for the assignment was to have student observe how transportation works or doesn't work in their community, um, identify a transportation issue or problem, um, and then collect information about the issue and interact with staff regarding that concern. So we provided a component for deeper engagement between the city and the participants. And then students were um, allowed, given the opportunity to propose a solution for their um, proposed for their identified issued and, and evaluate their solution. So they got to do like a mini um, a mini a mini transportation project in the weeks that they participated in TBCAT. Um, and so to help them through that, we identified several ways to provide support for these projects. Because once again, this isn't um, you know in a typical classroom format in person, there may be an opportunity to, you know, walk up to the professor and say, hey, I have this question about my assignment. Can I talk to you about my, my ideas? With a virtual platform, there really isn't a, an organic or natural opportunity for that. So we had to build it in. And we did that in a few ways. Uh, we asked in those evaluations that we sent out every week if they had questions. And if they did, we would um, either set up a time for a call or email about the issue so that we can help them. We hosted virtual office hours um, kind of at the midway point through the class. So once they had identified their issues, once they started collecting information, we held sessions where um, each person had about 10 to 15 minutes to talk with us about and, and brainstorm and walk through their project and get feedback and get resources. Um, we hosted or organized a virtual student lab with students at the University of South Florida. And these included students from planning and engineering and architecture and public administration and all these different fields who were able to provide technical support to the participants the students met weekly after they were um, um, paired up with a uh, with a TBCAP participant and talked to them about their project. They paired up and they um, consulted each other. They worked as a team to provide support and built on their skills. So we had a variety of skills from um, qualitative research to GIS to design and um, sketching and, and things like that to really provide full support. And um, not only did this give the TBCAT participants an opportunity to help build their project, but these gave those USF students, these graduate students, these emerging professionals, an opportunity to work closely with um, residents in a community, community in which they live. Um, so it really provided lots of benefit for everybody involved. Um, and then we also reserved um, the second to last session, so session number seven, for um, as a working session, uh, allowing the participants to walk through their project to get any last minute feedback before they presented their projects to the panel. Um, and so we also wanted to identify opportunities for in person. So in year one, um, we thought about it and unfortunately year one, there's not an opportunity for the participants to present their projects in person. But after year two, uh, we hosted an event and I'll, I'll talk about it a little more in the next slide or two, uh, where they were able to present their projects to a wide audience. And so first I'll just look really quick, have you all have a quick look at what the student lab, um, some of what the student lab produced. Um, this is an example. They all provided a report on how they supported the participants in TBCAD and the work they provided. These are all available online on the NICER website, um, along with the TBCAD project information. So you can take a look at those student reports. Um, 
but they helped um, in, in so many ways. They provided such good technical support to the participants. They, um, a few of them participated in the presentation. So they got a chance to present to residents and to those, um, those leaders and staff who were a part of the project panels. They got to participate with their um, participants as well. So it was a really, really great opportunity for everyone to get support. And um, it really provided those students with an opportunity to engage with residents. Um, so good, good work experience, good resume building experience for those students as well. And here's a look at the session, the Reconnecting Tampa session. It was held at Union Station in Tampa. Um, and this was held in 2023. And participants from year one and year two were invited to present their work and build posters and answer questions. This session was attended by TBCAT participants, other interested residents. It was attended by um, local agency staff. So from City of Tampa, from the Florida Department of Transportation, from HART, from these various agencies were in attendance, as well as several students um, from, as uh, from USF. So it was a very well attended, very broadly attended event that brought all these persons who are interested in transportation together into one room. Um, and this is uh, where we talked about those providing those opportunities for in-person interaction when available. Um, we found that, yes, there was some virtual fatigue. Yes, there was a bit of, um, there, there are times where, you know, staring at the screen can, can be can become a bit much and become a become a bit tiresome and so it was very very important that as we designed TVCAT we found opportunities for in person we found opportunities for um, more casual conversation about our interest in transportation our interest in the city um, and so events like these really really made that happen. Um, we identified other opportunities to engage with residents. So things like a field trip or tour. We had a walking tour that included a meet and greet. Um, so we were able to uh, meet with people multiple times beyond just um, on the screen or looking at each other's icons or um, occasionally turning on your camera to say hello. Um, we, we identified multiple touch points to meet. And so this is a look at the walkabout that we did. It was led by City of Tampa staff. We walked around the city. We looked at some new projects that had recently been completed or that were in progress. Um, we got the opportunity, um, one of the directors at City of Tampa uh, provided us the key to his uh, residence uh, where he lives in, in an apartment, and we were able to go on the roof and get a bird's eye view of the city, look at some of the projects that were happening on the ground from a really high up, beautiful view. Um, and it was really a one of a kind experience that we we thought was very, very important. It was a family friendly event. Um, so people were able to bring their kids if they wanted to. We provided vests to ensure that everyone was safe. Um, but it was really great. And then we went to um, a nearby um, area and we sat down and we talked for a few hours in very casual, very informal way. Um, and this is the key, one of the keys for us for relationship building um, beyond just the um, educational component within these cohorts, um, the relationship building, the um, informal conversations between residents and city staff um, to, to get to know each other a bit better was essential to the, the virtual module and making it more than just, um, um, you know, staring at the screens for two hours every uh, couple of weeks. So it was very important and very impactful and we got wonderful feedback on uh, the walkabout as well as the event that we had at Union Station. And at the end, um, we recommend following up. Um, we made it, we, we got feedback after year one or was asked to um, if, if participants could share their contact information. And so uh, we created a forum asking who wanted to participate in that uh, cohort email group. Um, and those who said yes, we shared their contact information with each other so that they can stay in touch. Um, we also provided certificates.
for year one and year two, and these were sent online and mailed. And it really was to commem commemorate their participation in TBCAT and really solidify that cohort that was formed in these years um, to, to really attempt to get beyond the, the somewhat impersonal nature of a virtual platform and make it a little more personal as well. Um, and all of this information and much more is provided in the guidebook. You can scan that QR code to access um, those uh, parts one and two of the, the model for Virtual Citizens Academy, as well as those templates and resources that can be customized. Um, and I'll leave that up for just a second. Um, so if you want to scan that. And then, um, Stephanie, I think we can have questions. Great, thank you um, so much, uh, Tia and Jason, for all of the great information. We received a number of questions uh, during the registration process that we should um, like. I would like to address uh, today. So, for those that are logged into Teams, um, I would like to just briefly remind you um, how to ask um, a question. I take control back. Uh, you have access to the chat window and the Q&A box, which is located in the upper right, uh, excuse me, the upper uh, left hand side of your screen. Um, so the first question comes in, it says, uh, was TBCAT only for City of Tampa residents? Uh, I can start with that one, Stephanie. So yes, originally it was for the City of Tampa residents. Uh, you know, we were, that was our target audience right there. We, we knew that this was a partnership with the city. It didn't make too much sense at the time to bring out other bring in other counties and and other cities in in the area. And you know we wanted to emphasize like that core group within the city, uh, th this this structure of the course. And we felt it was more manageable too, as far as the registration process. So we really just promoted it within the city. However, you know, T and I discussing the, the project from year one to year two and even after there was the opportunity for someone who lives outside the city and works in the city would have been a good idea. It would have been a good idea to have them involved and not just look at the zip code or their, where they lived in the location to to the as the determining factor of participation. And also, you know, we, we turned some pe people away from other cities that I think it would have been a, a really good learning point for a few of other, other people to join and understand how the city of Tampa works, you know. So, yeah, they're not from the city, but they could have uh, learned a lot what the city's doing. And maybe if they have some kind of decision making um, empowerment in their communities, maybe they could have taken that effort on to their, their experiences. But no, it, you know, hindsight, we probably should have included more more communities, different groups. I think it would have been a good idea. But for year one, I think it was just important for us to get get used to the fact that we're online and we're talking to a group within an area that we know of. We can't hear you, Stephanie. Yeah, yes, just realized that. Um, so next question comes in and says, uh, did the outreach include uh, underserved the underserved communities within the city? Yes, it, it did. Uh, we we did a, a, a large outreach with that. You know, my experience working with the city of Tampa and the communities within the city of Tampa, um, including like Sulphur Springs, you know, we reached out to that community um, where I had extensive experience working with the community and other parts of Tampa where the undeserved communities within Tampa, you know, whether it's putting out flyers or connecting with Facebook groups, um, you know, sending a message, hey, we got this program, you mind putting the flyer out in the community or sharing with your community? Um, yeah, so we we did an extra effort to make sure that we had some representation and, and, and people involved in all, all communities within the city. And also the city of Tampa helped us with that too. You know, they have an ex a wide a wide reach within the city, um, particularly with their neighborhood association group. Um, I mean, there's so many neighborhood association groups within the city. So it's you have those leaders reaching out to their individual communities. So we had a broad, broad reach with our 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 in, include inclusive inclusivity. Sorry. Then just sort of, I, 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Tia. Sorry, I was going to say if I can add to that um, in feedback that we got um, previously, um, noting that this was geared specifically to City of Tampa staff, but um, we we want to emphasize uh, in even in the use of the guidebook that um, if if involving uh, rural areas, for example, parcels in rural areas, um, that the the hybrid model is is effective, and that is important to identify or get a um, a understanding of who's in the community and what their internet access and technology needs are, so that you can really build a um, customized uh, process to ensure that you involve underserved communities or persons that live in rural areas um, who may not have as um, reliable bandwidth or um, may not have um, easily access to to technology. I guess, Atia, that was going to be my follow up question was, you, you know, did you have a plan in place um, for those that may not have access to broadband or technology um, uh, from from your outreach for these communities, these underserved communities? And if you can, if you did, I see you shaking your head. Yes. Do you want to share potentially what that plan would have involved? Yeah, um, we did. Uh, we asked in the survey if people had access to the Internet, um, how and so on the survey, how they access the Internet or where they access the Internet, if they had access to devices that could access teams, because that that's what we used. Um, and the the question led them to um, a follow up. They said no, that they did not have access to those things regularly. Um, we included contact information for Jason as the lead facilitator um, to assist in troubleshooting and identifying um, where they may be able to access the um, the the internet or access a computer to be able to uh, participate in the course. Great, thank you. Um, how did you uh, keep track of attendance? Oh yeah, keeping track of attendance, you know, with the Teams option, which is what we're on now, uh, you can keep track of attendance each meeting. You can have a, a report based on the prompting you do before the meeting. Um, you can also see, you know, who was really involved. There's there's channels within Teams as the administrator of the meeting to see who was really attentive to the meeting and who stayed online throughout the duration of the the course uh, each week, each week. So it's pretty interesting. Can, we didn't really know this going into it and we just found out. So it was kind of a trial by error, but it worked out to our advantage. And again, we reached out to a lot of those who were really attending and said, hey, you know, thanks for joining. And you know, do you have any questions about this week's uh, session? And again, we sent, we're very, uh, we emphasize communication through email. Um, we provided our contact information. So communication is a two-way street with this uh, whole platform. And we were readily available at all times to um, just be in a, a assistance in any troubleshooting. And that includes the student project too, uh, the participating project too. We, we, as Tia mentioned, we had labs and uh, we we set time aside just to meet with those who had questions, and we we're there to troubleshoot. Great, thank you. Um, what was the or what was the, what was the selection criteria for the guest speakers? Uh, I yeah I, I guess uh, with the selection criteria with year one, and again this is you know brainstorming with. The city of Tampa representative that was uh, assisting this project with us and and Tia, we, you know, we got together and you know originally we wanted someone from, let's say, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, the city, the county. We wanted different agencies, even some nonprofits, um, just all transportation. And then going into year two, again, we had a lot of these for year one. We had a lot of these uh, uh, networking and, and relationships with these agencies already. So it's just really finding that one person that would like to come and talk to the group about that topic, whatever the topic may be. Going into year two, um, you know, that we talked to the city and they want they wanted more city departments to be a part of this uh, rather than the multi-agencies. Even though we had other agencies come in, it was really more city emphasis uh, with, with these departments uh, in, in dealing with transportation and mobility and planning. So we felt that year two was a little different and more city focused. Great, thank you. Um, did you run into any technical um, issues uh, during the sessions and how did you ensure that the sessions ran smoothly? So um, 
we did in year one uh, more than anything. And so we had to come up with some uh, contingency plans. And um, one of a few of the things that we did was um, Jason and I, uh, we exchanged numbers. So in the event that if either one of our um, internet went down, if the computer shut off, because we ran into that, um, in the first few times we were able to send a quick text, say, hey, my internet just went out, can you take over? And the participants honestly had no idea um, that we were kind of out of commission temporarily. And uh, because we had that um, line of communication in the back to say, I'm having some issue, my computer's frozen, or I don't know what's going on, but I can't turn my mic on. Um, uh, so that was very, very, very helpful to have just a backup plan um, in the event that anything was to happen. For the uh, presenters, we had them send uh, their presentations ahead of time um, because there were a few who were not familiar with the platform and had some difficulty um, sharing their slides. Um, so we were able to share it on our end or if their computer was frozen and maybe they had to call in or um, join by some other means, we had the presentation up ready to go in the queue just in case we ran into some issues. So we really had to try to be um, forward thinking and really quick on our feet. Um, to, to address those technical issues. Yes. A by year point. two, it was smoothless. <laughs> As I say, a backup, was, plan, smooth. a backup plan is always good when it comes to yes. tech, it always comes to technology. <laughs> I do have the evaluation up. You can either click on the link or scan the QR code to fill in the evaluation. It does look like we have one final question. Uh, so if another city state organization were to, would be interested in setting up a virtual experience similar to TBCAT, what is one thing you wish you had known before getting started that you would sort of share um, as a lesson learned uh, for them? And uh, we'll take one from Tia and one from Jason. Uh, what what do you think? Jason, you want to go first? I'll go first. <laughs> I <laughs> I think looking back, uh, again, I mentioned this before, it's kind of a two part. Um, wish we had include people that lived outside the city limits, but worked in the city. That's one thing. And the other thing is emphasizing with those partnering cities or counties, whoever's uh, partnering with this, uh, you know, how important it is to share that information uh, through social media channels, through their partners off the bat you know we we kind of figured that out later even though it was kind of a given okay yeah of course you got to share but how that important that was to bring in uh participants that was so important to get their not only their buy-in but as far as you know sharing the information and keep it going with all their community partners great thank you tia yes um i would say that um for other cities wanting to have a similar experience um, what I would suggest is um, involve involve students, whether it be college students, whether it be high school, middle school students. Um, we really, really benefited from the student community at USF, the perspectives they were able to share, um, the knowledge that they have, the technical skills that they have. Um, and I do think if there was an opportunity to, for us to also involve um, younger kids as well, because the way they see the world and the way they see transportation is so informative, it's so refreshing. Um, and I do think that um, if the opportunity is is provided, I think involving those groups as well um, can really strengthen the outcome. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jason and Tia for all the great information. As I said, that evaluation is on the screen. Hopefully you had a few minutes to complete that as the feedback is not only important to our presenters today, but the entire uh, NICER uh, webcast uh, series. Um, we do have a, uh, our next webinar is will be forthcoming. As I mentioned earlier, please stay connected to the NICER website at, website at nicer.usf.edu uh, to subscribe to our listserv um, and eblast about all of our upcoming uh, webinars. So again, on behalf of the National Institute for Congestion Reduction, uh, Jason and Tia, thank you so much for today's webinar, and we'll see you all real soon. Bye, everybody.